Well, hey there, this is part two of the Social Dimension Lectures. Once again, made into small bites so they will be easily digestible by you and easily uploaded or digested by the internet and maybe even Moodle, who knows. Um, this is just part two of the Social Dimensions of Happiness Lectures for March 31st, 2020. One thing we covered in lab last week, we talked a bit, or you talked a bit, on your discussion boards about self-esteem and what kind of information you got on the strengths questionnaire, as well as what kind of information you got in the natural talent interviews. And uh, this, I think, is important with regard to self-esteem, but also self-esteem is really core or central to establishing friendships and romantic relationships. You know the old adage, you need to love yourself first before you can love others. And I think that's generally true, although not always, because sometimes when we're loved by others, it helps us to love ourselves better. But I would say that, or I will say, that uh, even if you can't love yourself completely, at least you should try to like some things about yourself and develop behaviors that you think are attractive or likable from other people's perspectives as well as your own. And that's because how we feel about ourselves, we can call that self-esteem, self-worth, self-image, but how we feel about ourselves really influences everything. Even though I know in chapter six, Bono is kind of anti self-esteem movement. I agree with some of what he says, but how we feel about ourselves in the end is going to be important. Uh, and so it is a good time to think about how do your strengths, how do your natural talents play out in your relationships? How do they help you establish relationships? How do they strengthen your relationships? And how can you use your natural talents um, to make your relationships not only strong, but longer lasting? Um, here's a short story uh, that's related to um, self-esteem and relationships. how we feel about ourselves is so crucial to the success of relationships, uh, friendships, as well as romantic relationships. I'm reminded of doing counseling with a 22 year old young man and he was very depressed. He had not been getting out much. He was pretty socially isolated. Um, and, and yet he, I, I'd seen him off and on for about hmm, 11 years. And so I knew him pretty well, and I also um, got some feedback from a colleague of mine who had seen him in the waiting room and had a nice chat with him in the waiting room and who had told me, oh, this, this young man you're seeing is very, very affable and uh, has good social skills. And so w when this 22-year-old comes in, I tell him this story about how uh, my colleague, another psychologist, said that he was affable and had good social skills and uh, didn't really make much of the interaction. Um, and then a few weeks later, he, he came in and he said, you know, I went on a raft trip and I met a young woman and I liked her and I was attracted to her and I wanted to see her again, but uh, that meant I had to call her. And I just was so absolutely frightened to call her that I just sat by the phone and I couldn't do it. I was frozen, but then I had this thought and I thought, huh, Dr. John told me that I have good social skills and his colleague told me or told Dr. John that I have good social skills. So I, I must have good social skills. I'm going to call her and I'm going to ask her out. And he did. And she said yes. And they got together. And the last I knew, they were still together and he was doing really well. Um, and I think a lot of it had to do with just a little nudge for him to recognize that he had good social skills, that he was a friendly person who could engage in positive conversation. And to have that thought from the counseling enter his mind 
and give him just that little nudge that gave him the confidence, the good feelings about himself to be able to put himself out there to take the risk of making the phone call. And I think we've all been in those kind of situations where we're scared to ask someone out or we're scared to approach somebody and start a conversation. Um, another reason why it's so important for us to develop social skills and conversational skills that can help provide a foundation for social relationships, but maybe even more important, so it can give us confidence and we can take the risks that we need to take to get in healthy relationships. And so that issue of taking risks, of being able to step forward and to be involved and be vulnerable and connect with other people to establish relationships, it's a huge issue for many people. Uh, and so I wonder what skills give you the confidence to approach other people at work, at school, or for friendships or for romantic introductions? What helps you when you're sitting by a phone or you're thinking about texting someone who you're kind of interested in? What helps you step up? What helps you to, what reminds you of the positive qualities that you have to offer in relationships? Another way, another question um, to think about is what thoughts, what goes through your mind that helps to give you the strength to initiate conversations as opposed to the thoughts that make it harder for you to initiate conversations. We probably have distinctive thoughts that go in both directions. And so um, to summarize, we need more confidence, but we also need more than confidence. Uh, and we also need skills to base our confidence on. There's nothing like real experience and real success to give us the confidence we need to develop positive relationships. And so the question is, how do people develop social skills, but also more specifically listening skills? And obviously you're gonna hear a bias here from me. I think listening skills are huge and important in relationships. One method for experiencing social connection and empathy is through counseling. And I hope that you experience some of this in your individual happiness sessions, and maybe, if you, maybe some of you still are. But we can also learn about listening skills from counselors and from counseling, because counselors are trained to be good listeners. If they're not, then they have forgotten some of their training, or maybe they didn't, uh, maybe they were not trainable, I don't know. Uh, here's some, some basics about active listening, because this is a really challenging thing to do, and yet really important thing to learn. The first foundation for active listening is to have a listening attitude. In other words, when you're with someone, to sit with intention to listen to them. To have the intention to understand them from their perspective. At the same time, realizing you can never perfectly understand another person. And to even say, I understand, is not really good listening. Instead, we want to try to understand the other person's perspective and have the intention of doing that. And to do that, we also show attending skills, and that has to do with body posture, usually a little bit lean forward, uh, eye contact, and that, that varies based on culture, but for the most part, you know, 60 to 80% eye contact, usually looking at people when they're talking and looking away when you're talking or vice versa, depending on your cultural background. Um, Vocal qualities and, you, you know, different when somebody's listening to you and they say something back to you and there's kind of sharpness in their voice. That's not great listening or attending skills. Uh, whereas if they speak um, with compassion and uh, gentle, softer voice, more receptive voice, obviously that is better attending. We also use verbal tracking in addition to nodding our head, which has to do with our body posture. 
We also will say short things like, oh yeah, and mm-hmm, and things like that to make it clear that we're listening. And of course, any of these things you can do too much of. And so you don't want to nod your head too much and you don't want to say, uh-huh, too much. But they are things that give people a signal that you're listening. We want to use paraphrasing. And uh, that really involves that classic thing of, so what you're saying is, uh, what I hear you saying is, uh, any way you can reflect the content of what somebody said back to them. Paraphrasing is thought of as rewording something so it's not exactly in the other person's words and saying it back to them in the moment. Uh, clarifying is a little bit associated with paraphrasing in that oftentimes we'll paraphrase first and then we'll ask, is that is that right? Do I, do I have that right? Is that something, is, am, I, am I understanding your perspective? And so we wanna check on those kinds of things using a clarifying question. And then reflection of feeling uh, to say things like you seem upset. And notice I have the word upset there because sometimes uh, more specific emotional words can be too much too soon. Like if you say you feel sad or you feel angry or you feel scared, those words can be threatening. Um, and yet uh, counselors who are good are able to do that, reflect feelings in ways that are uh, that, that feel really meaningful to the people who are talking. And then using summary or bigger paraphrases, you know, summarizing, you know, five or 10 minutes of, of talking with somebody together and summarizing it together with them. Oh, I'm trying to remember what kinds of things we talked about. I think you said this and I said that. And trying to summarize that will also show that you're doing a good job listening. If you want to learn more about active listening and how counselors use active listening, there's a 15 minute educational video. I put a link there. Uh, this comes from a book that my wife Rita and I wrote uh, called Clinical Interviewing. And in this video, we talk a little bit about active listening. But what I like the most about this video is we have uh, some people demonstrating active listening. We have Chris Fiore from the psychology department demonstrating it. We have a woman named Megan Rides at the Door, Native American woman who's demonstrating active listening and non-directive listening. Uh, and so there's some pretty good examples of how to do it well. I recommend the video, I'm not requiring it. And then um, active listening is really one of the ways that we try to communicate empathy. And empathy in counseling is viewed as one of the most powerful ways to help people have positive results from counseling. Empathy is defined as feeling with someone. In other words, being in their shoes, feeling the feelings that they feel. We sometimes use the word resonating resonating it's like a piano resonating with another piano notes resonating with each other resonating is not the same as resignating i know some people get confused and say resignating it's not a word resonating is the right word it's not the same as sympathy empathy is to feel with sympathy it can be nice but it's really feeling sorry for someone and of course active listening is one of the ways that we communicate empathy. And empathy, as it turns out, is a lot like meditation. And if you do it well, and you engage in active listening as a practice, you can produce what's called neurogenesis. And we talked about that early in the semester. Neurogenesis is the birth of brain cells. So we can create new and more brain cells in the area of our brain that's linked to empathy and listening well. We probably think it is causing the thickening of the insula. Now you might think having a thick insula doesn't sound very good. In fact, it is a very good thing. It helps with self-control. It helps with the ability to reflect on our behaviors before we engage in them. And it helps us have better skills at putting ourselves in the shoes or the moccasins of the other people so that 
um, we have empathy for them. Research would suggest that these four steps help you to develop a thicker insula or better listening skills. And that is to listen with intention or an attitude like meditation, like loving kindness meditation. To practice listening, set aside time to do it and do it regularly. And then to read and watch materials that have emotional content and work to take the other person's perspective and feel empathy when you digest or watch that emotional content. And then enrolling in uh, grad school or engaging in a professional activity that involves lots of listening and the classic disciplines for this are social work counseling and psychology, at least within the University of Montana. Now this next slide, uh, there's a short clip of me doing some counseling and it's not great counseling, but I'm doing something in an effort to try to connect with this 19 year old young man who's referred to counseling because he's experienced some trauma related to being in a gang. And Michael, the client already had talked with me about how he got in the gang life and how it was good to be inactive. He was no longer active in the gang because he was at Job Corps in Darby, Montana, where there were no gangs. Uh, uh, and and I make a comment in an effort to connect with Michael and I just want to show you this video and you can then uh, think about whether or not my comment was something that was helpful in connecting with Michael. And here's the video. You, you made a good pick. Yeah. <laughs> you think? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I just had this funny image come into my mind. I'm just going to tell you what it was. Okay. I just had this, this really funny thought that, what if you were dressed like me? <laughs> <laughs> you can't even imagine it, can you? No. I just thought to myself, what if we just like switched? Actually, you'd look pretty cool with this I would. On. I would look really good. You, you made a good... Now, what's true in that interaction with Michael? Is that you know he's probably lying with lying to me because I really would not look good in his outfit, but I think the whole idea of us being able to talk about how we have some differences and we have some similarities um, is a useful thing in counseling. But really, what's more important is um, what do you think? Do you think that commenting on and comparing clothes was a useful way for me to connect with Michael? What do you think makes for good social connection in counseling? That's one question. But then what do you want? What do you do when you want to connect with someone? And what do you want in terms of social behaviors from other people? What do you like? What do you find attractive in terms of social behaviors? It's not going to be the same for everybody. Um, and what connects well for Michael and me or works well for the two of us might not work well for other people in counseling, but other people in their social relationships. It's quite individualized. Let's do our quick review. Love can increase self-esteem and self-esteem can make love possible. It kind of goes both directions. Um, I really think one thing that we don't emphasize enough is how much love or being loved can help us feel better about ourselves. Social skills can be learned. We can learn about listening skills in particular from counselors and counseling. Listening skills being one type of social skill that might help us connect better with other people who we want to connect with. Listening well involves several different behaviors and a listening attitude. And like meditation, listening can, the practice of listening regularly to others can change your brain, can increase or thicken the size of your insula. Empathy is an important goal of active listening. Uh, that that's one of the reasons we do active listening is so people will feel like we can resonate and connect with how they are experiencing things. And then what you find desirable in terms of listening and social skills will likely be unique to you. And as you explore these things, the goal of exploring these things and of focusing on the social dimension, of course, is to increase your happiness, to increase your well-being, to increase the wellness you feel about yourself and your life. And the conclusions, as usual, are what do you want to remember and how will you use this in your life?
Thanks for listening. More coming soon.